Hello, my name is Dr. Arthur McClunu. I've dedicated my life to providing surgical care to patients with heart disease. My life began in the slums of Soweto in South Africa, where I learned to overcome adversity and illnesses, including the death of my best friend. That's why I want to be a resource for you and your family for consultation related to heart and cardiovascular needs. You can learn more about me by visiting my website, which is at ZuluChessCutter.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the next edition of the Rolling Grimes, not just sports and entertainment show. We have a beautiful day here in October at uh, the Old Angler Inn in Potomac, Maryland. Five-star restaurant. You folks put it on your calendar to come in and enjoy some of the fine dining that's offered here at the Old Angler Inn. When we first started this show, this is one of the main reasons why we began this whole process so we have a chance to sit down and talk to people like my guests. But even before I introduce them, I want you all to put your hands together as we welcome back my resident co-host and chief archaeologist, Mr. Self-Empowerment Wilbur Skipper. And as always, and as always, we have a dynamite show for you today. This gentleman to my left is uh, none other than Mr. Gary Clark. Gary Clark has a distinguished career and athletics, but he's expanded himself into other areas of business, business and industry. He's going to tell you a lot about it as we go forward a little bit. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to Mr. Gary Clark. Hey, thank you, Rose. How are you? My pleasure. Yeah, pleasure Gary, Gary, I'm going to tilt my chair a little bit so I can see <laughs> you, man. I'm following your lead. I love that smile. <laughs> Look here, man. There's a lot of people who are going to Google your name right now just because we said it. And they're going to find out all these things, all of these things that you've been involved in. Oh, no, they're not going to find out anything. That's what's going to come up. That's what's going to show up. They're going to be like, who's Gary Clark? <laughs> all right, so Wikipedia, G-A-R-1. <laughs> so nonetheless. Gary, tell us a little bit about where you've been. Where are you originally from, and how did you get to the D.C. area, and what have you been doing in this area since you arrived a few decades ago? Well, basically, well, again, Gary Clark. Grew up in Pulaski County, went to Pulaski County High School in Virginia. Uh, started playing my football at an early age, five and a half years old. Uh, I told my father at five and a half years old that I wanted to be a professional football player. He sat me down at the kitchen table after he had his chuckle. He sat me down at the kitchen table and um, kind of mapped out my philosophy moving forward, meaning that everybody has dreams, right. but there's only a certain way you can turn them into reality. So um, I first started my dreams playing Sandlot football, and then Pee Wee football, then Sandlot football, then eighth grade, ninth grade. Had a pretty good high school career at Pulaski County where I played wide receiver and I played safety. Okay. Uh, went on to James Madison University where I had a major in social science, a okay. BS degree in social science. Um, from, now, did you do four years at James Madison or I five? did. I did. Um, actually, I did more like three and a half. Really? Three and a half, and I left school early. I had to come back to finish my degree. I left school early to go play in the United States Football League. I mm. played with the Jacksonville Bulls. I were the the number one pick that year okay. for the Jacksonville Bulls in the draft. I was the sixth pick in the draft that year. Okay. Um, in the same year, the Washington Redskins also drafted me in their supplemental draft. I was their second pick for the Washington Redskins, so they had the rights to me. And eventually, uh, after Jacksonville, I moved on to the NFL. I uh, came into Washington, where I was fortunate enough to play um, eight years in Washington, a burgundy and gold uniform. Um, probably the best part of my career was spent in Washington. But after Washington, I moved to Phoenix for two years where I played with the Cardinals. And then I finished up in Miami in my, my last season after an 11-year career. And uh, I guess um, I had a decent career. It, it was okay. <laughs> oh, we're going we're gonna to embellish it a little bit sure. later. <laughs> but as we do that, real quick, Skip, before you jump in, here's the thing. You actually participated in a Super Bowl or two, is that correct? Tell us a little I, bit about that. I, I played in a couple, a couple of those <laughs> too. And um, kids dream come true. I mean, what can you say? Um, as a child growing up, I always wanted to play professional football. I always wanted to play in the Super Bowl. But to actually be able to see your dream come to reality 
following those steps that my father had told me what I needed to do as a child that allowed me to get to that point. And being able to score a touchdown in my, in my first Super Bowl and being able to duplicate that effort in the second Super Bowl was really, really a, really a childhood dream come true for me. It's just um, it's an unbelievable experience. I guess what, like anybody who achieves their dream, no matter, mm -hmm. what's it, what, no matter what's its end, you achieve your dream, it becomes reality. It's, it's a time to sit back. And the only thing that's, um, quite honestly, been better than that feeling is, you know, my kids. Well, my mom was still mad at me because I broke an antique <laughs> chair when you scored that first touchdown. I was jumping up and down so hard. Skip. Well, now, Gary, for, for me, I always like to take people back mm -hmm. and, and, and allow them to talk about what really motivated them as a kid. Um, Roland had a dream of becoming an NFL football player. I had a dream of becoming an NBA basketball player. We have those dreams as kids. What would you say is, if not the most single, contribution that was given to you so you could help facilitate that and also from your standpoint what motivated you and just kept driving you to try to reach that goal which you did reach that goal I think I think some people by their very nature are very competitive and I think I'm one of those people um, my brothers played football before me um, they were very good at the craft I saw how proud my parents were of my brothers um, and as a little kid you don't look at them as just being proud parents. You're like, well, my brother's getting all that love and affection from mom and dad. <laughs> whatever that is. So sure, I, sure, exactly, exactly what it's yeah. like. So whatever that is, I want it. You know, my brothers, again, they were very, very good at playing football. They had a lot of trophies, so my goal was to have more trophies, to gather more trophies than that. But I think the biggest key for me to be able to do that is focus. That's what my dad always taught me. you got to focus on the task at hand, what you want to get done. You focus on it, and you don't sidestep it. You're going to have friends. There's going to be girls. There's going to be all these things that try to make you stop before you finish your work. And most people, oh, you know what? I'll finish practicing tomorrow because I need to go to the party with my friends. I mean, fun. That's just as a kid. I mean, fun things that most kids want to do and yeah. should do, quite honestly. I'm not saying that. But for me, I didn't go to the party. I still did those things, but I didn't go until my work was finished. Okay. You know, if I had a schedule for that day that I had to do a certain amount of things that was going to make me a better player, I did yeah. not not finish those things. And I think a lot of times that's the biggest op obstacle for right. most people is not walking the straight and yeah. not getting sidetracked. Next thing you get sidetracked, it's been a year that you've been sidetracked and right. you didn't get back to what you were still. And you lose out some time. Exactly. And, the, and those sidetracks can be unlimited, as a matter of fact, oh, in no. time. And it's probably even and worse and nowadays. Yeah. With technology yeah. the technology exactly. is, it's probably a lot worse for the kids that are doing what they're doing now as opposed to yeah. when I was coming up. Makes sense. Hey, folks, we're going to take a station break on Rolling Grimes, not just sports entertainment show. I'm your host, Rolling Bubba Grimes. We'll be back to you very shortly. Sit tight. Welcome back to the Rolling Grimes, not just sports and entertainment show. Again, we're shooting live in front of a beautiful studio audience here at the Old Angler Inn in Potomac, Maryland with my main man here, Gary Clark, NFL legend, watched the risk and Super Bowl victor, actually started his career with the USFL according to, I didn't know this, and this is what we <laughs> learned on the Rolling Grimes show. Gary, now, I'm going to tell you. I just love the voice. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I have a voice like that, man? That's not even fair. No, we can, we can do a trade-off. Oh, my God. So this is what we're going to do. My daddy gave me this voice. Oh, my so God. So tell, tell me what your father gave to you oh, while you were growing up. I mean, now, let's talk about this. Pretty much, I mean, when it comes to my father, I mean, it's, it's the driving force that's in me now. I lost him probably about four years ago. Had a, had a good life, a long life. Um, Got to see um, his kids grow up, his grandkids. Unfortunately, uh, he lost one of his sons, my brother Milton. Um, you never supposed to outlive your kids. We both mm -hmm. know that, and that had an effect on him as well. But um, everything that I am today is really is me trying to get to the point where my father was. He was the best man I know. He was my role model. Don't get me wrong. I grew up as a football guy. I had 
people that I like to play basketball. I have people that I like to play football, mm. um, baseball, the whole the whole gamut. But my role model, my only role model in terms of who I wanted to become in terms of a man from the time I was a little boy was my father. And I still have a long way to go before I even come close to being the man that he was. He was the best man that I know, without a doubt. What are some? What are one or two of those elements of your father that you saw early on that you said, I need to emulate that, or you know what? Daddy said, hey, you take this, and I want you to incorporate that into your life. Well, I think mostly just um, hard work and love for his family. I mean, my father, jobs that I knew he had, was school bus driver, um, janitor, uh, eventually he's got to start his own little janitorial company, but I knew when I was growing up, he had probably three or four odd jobs mm -hmm. that I didn't even know about. And it was all about taking care of his family, making sure that his family, like I didn't know I was poor until I went to college. When I went to college, I feel like, I mean, wait a minute, I don't have what all these <laughs> other guys had. I thought I was middle class growing up in the middle class. I didn't have that as middle class. So, but being able to allow me to live out my dream because he listened to me at five and a half. He sat down, we had that conversation after. It's very important. My first job ever was playing professional football. Mm. I mean, we were poor. I didn't know, but they did not make me work. They didn't make me go, and I sh I'm sure it would have helped the family as I was able to go and help in, pitch in, and do those things. Newspaper route. Yeah. You know, exactly, yeah. whatever. But, you know, he, un he saw my focus, and it's the focus that I'm sure I gained from him, you know, and my mother, of course. But um, he allowed me to go after my dream, fulfill my dream, and, you know, like, again, the man I'm trying to be now, notice I said trying to be now, is yep. still trying to get to the point where, you know, he was always proud of his kids, all of his kids, no matter what they did. He was proud of his kids, but I don't need ask, him. I need to take it to another level. Gotcha. Let me ask mm -hmm. you a little bit about that. You had some older brothers. Tell, I did. Tell me about uh, that. I had two brothers, Michael and Milton, um, both just great athletes, very blessed. Um, all the boys in our family all got full scholarships. We all got full rides to colleges. Um, my brother Michael went to Appalachian State where he played um, football there. And my other brother Milton started off at UVA started off at UVA and he was probably one of the best football players I've ever seen, ever, ever. Just, just a talented, talented guy in high school. That's quite, quite a compliment. Oh, yeah. I mean, he played lineman at UVA. When he transferred to Appalachian State, he played tailback, fullback, tailback. That's that's the type of athlete that he yeah, was. That, he that was does, a guy. He that was doesn't a, happen. Not at all. So he was just uh, the guy that, once he went to college though, unfortunately, he kind of enjoyed it a little, a little too much. That focus kind of left, you know, the focus kind of left. But, it shifted um, a little bit. He was one of the smartest guys I know. He's like, you know, he's a 4-0 student his whole, his whole life. I, uh, that was not me. I was not a 4-0 student, but we could never drop a little B average or our dad wouldn't let us play sports anymore. So um, it was, um, I, I had a family of people that I looked up to. I got to emulate my brothers taught me almost everything I know about football in terms of as a kid growing up. I mean, I was doing drills as a kid that, you know, people just don't do right. at yeah. that age, yeah. learning the game. Well, Gary, for, for me, I mean, you talked about your father, mm -hmm. an extension of the family and in, within the family. Now, when Roland and I, we, we all play sports. Right. There was a gentleman in my life by the name of Glenn Harris, oh, okay. who was with uh, Channel 8 Sports. Glenn's and Glenn, guy. outside of my father, because I share a similar story that you share, and I'm sure Roland has a similar right. story as well. We all had our fathers in our life. But outside of the home, was there anybody that played a, a, a pivotal or was a was an important person in your life as you were going through this process? Uh, and, sure, I think, I think all my coaches were. I mean, a lot of my coaches, first of all, for putting up with me, first of all, because I'm a guy that, tends to always speak his mind, no matter what. I've learned that from my father as well. You know, if you got something to say, you say it, you speak your mind. And in a competitive nature, I always did. Like, I grew up, we all grew up in an era where it was black and white. Winning's good, losing's bad. Mm -hmm. Now it's kind of gray. There was no yeah, trophy. Yeah, there was, there was, it was not yeah, exactly. And, and you know, everybody didn't necessarily make the team. You know, you didn't play everybody. You played the people that have worked hard, deserved a position to play in a whole nine yards. So my coaches, uh, Joe Hicks, you know, got me into college. You know, he, he, he showed those college coaches my film relentlessly, showing people that, hey, this kid has the opportunity, he can play. My college coach, Charles McMillan, who uh, taught me, you know, humble, 
you know, you, you got to be humble when you play this game as well. You also have to listen to people that have something to say. You can't always be that person and not listening. You know, and for me, I, I, I thought I knew it all a lot of the time. Yeah. You know, and probably still one of my flaws now. I still think I, I know it all most of the time. Mm -hmm. But understanding and listening to other people, what they have to say, being able to learn, and I say steal in the right way. There's mm -hmm. other athletes who have great gifts and talents that they've thought of doing things that could help your game out. And Jerry Rice, Art Monk, Ricky Sanders, all yeah. these people that I respected, Al Toon from the Jets, you know, all these guys that were great, great receivers that allowed me to sit back and watch what they do and take a little bit from their game and add it to my game. So, I mean. Which requires a certain amount of humility just oh, to be able com to completely do that. because, you know, uh, football, as you guys know, sports in general, yeah. it's a tricky thing. It's a psyche that you play with, you know, giving yourself the right edge. Like my edge, I would never watch film on my opponent. But it was just to give me an edge because when you get to those levels, you have to be able to give yourself some type of edge. My edge was if I look at the film, it won't be fair. That was my edge. So now I had to come out and get myself up every game because if you didn't look at the film, you don't know what they're going to do. So now you have to bring your A game all the time. Now trust me, there are certain times I probably should have looked at the film. <laughs> but, <laughs> but for my psyche and my mental part of the game, that gave me my edge where I could come out and be like, okay, I'm gonna come out the ball today. You know, that's just, that's just how I got prepared. And now, after football, it's kind of the same thing. You know, you, know, you, you come up with strategies and, um, and creative and mindsets of what you're doing. And a lot of times when you introduce these things to individuals, they never heard of it, they never seen it. Right. So they don't, therefore they yeah. don't believe in it. But it's no different than those kids saying that, hey, you're too small, you're too short, you right. can't play professional football, Absolutely. why even go to try? Yeah. Then you go to hell you know, and then you go do those things. Right. And I'm, I'm a big fan of proving people wrong. Okay. Uh, I mean, I thrive on it, quite yeah. honestly. And it's good to be able to use that. I, I can't play ball no more. I don't have that competitive nature. But the being able to come out there and and be right in the right way right. is very, very important. All right, folks, we're going to take a station break from the Rolling Grimes and not just sports and entertainment show. When we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more to Gary Clark, who was the not so not so much diva wide receiver as we see in today's ball. We're going to talk to him a little bit about the difference between the two. And then we're going to get a little bit more into what he's doing now and where he's going into the future. And I'm going to take another station break and work on my enunciation. <laughs> hey, folks, we'll be back to you very shortly. Rolling grabs, Wilbur Skipper, Gary Clark. Sit tight. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back to the Rolling Grimes, not just sports and entertainment show. I went and took some uh, some English classes while we were doing a station <laughs> break so I can get my tongue together for you. Hey folks, welcome back. Mr. Self Apartment, Wilbur Skipper. My guest for today, Mr. Gary Clark. Gary, there's a slight difference between the wide receivers that we're watching today and when you played. We're going to run some footage of when you played and when you scored a touchdown or when you had a first down and we noticed that um, you kind of didn't do as much after the play stuff as we see today. Contrast for me the difference between either you and the guys that played in your era and what you see now, or is this just the natural evolution of the star athlete? I, I, just, I just think it's, it's just a part of the game and growth of the game. I mean, I don't, trust me, if you get in the end zone and you score a touchdown, I know how hard it is. So I'm fine with you celebrating <laughs> it all day long. I mean, even myself, you know. I mean, I would try to get involved with the fans after I scored. You know, I had more me running around the mm -hmm. stadium trying to get the fans into the game. You had a little bit um, of the fun bunch during your time? Well, the fun bunch was a little bit before me. We were the posse, but it's the mm -hmm. compliment when people 
they call me a Smurf, they mm -hmm. call me a Fun yeah, Bunch, they call me all that because I think mostly of my size, they, yeah. they kind of... Howard Cosell had a that. few names for you. Hey, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he had, a, he had a, too bad he said one of Alvin Gary, right. but <laughs> once he ended his career. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Alvin absolutely. Gary. Absolutely. Yeah. But he didn't mean anything by, no, yeah, Howard, he didn't mean right, anything right. by, he didn't mean it in that yeah. way, but they took it that way. Right. But, um, no, I mean, I actually... You know, I, I don't get the celebrating after you get a first down. I, I mean, a small hand clap or something like that. I don't get. But everybody's everybody's different. But whatever makes you a better player, if that makes you play better, if that because everybody got their own thing that makes them play better. I'm okay with that, and I think it's the game is meant for the fans. You know, yeah. I, I think it is entertainment. You know, I mean, let's. Well, at that I hate, when, I hate yeah. when people get it twisted like mm -hmm. what athletes do and what entertainers do is more than entertainment. They're, I get so upset when they, they call us heroes and stuff like that. I mean, heroes are people that play the sport. I can understand that. If you're a kid, you want to play football, you want to play wide receiver, you want to be like, oh, I understand that. Like, he's Childhood a hero on that thing. Yeah. But, yeah. but the true term of the hero, like, we're not military. We're, we're not, not teachers. In a yeah. You know, we're not firefighters. We're not doing any of those things that, that are a hero every day. I can be a hero for a game. You know, it's doing the NFL. I play 16 games in a year, so I'm, I'm a hero 16 times. Yeah. But these people are heroes every day of their lives, and um, I just hate when they they put us next. To that but it's not the same thing. Yeah. I didn't save anybody's life. Right. Well, know. a lot of times they have their own definition. Of exactly. Who you are. I mean, I understand when they use yeah. it in a sports thing. Mm -hmm. as long as they use it in, in sports terms, and the sports community, the, oh, and the heroes in the sports community, that's fine. But let's not get it twisted with yeah. who, who the true heroes are. So today. in the so within the context of the sport. Hey, we have this player who's a hero in terms of what he's doing right. the for his team, for his community I'm okay with that within term. the sport. Outside of that, but don't yeah. don't put me up there next to a person who's mm -hmm. went and, and fought for our country, mm -hmm. saved her. Right. Don't put me beside that person mm -hmm. and, and say hero, hero. That ain't true. Right. That's just not true. Okay. Yeah, so, two two different levels. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a completely different level. Yeah. Now, when we talk about transition, mm -hmm. um, we all know that there are a lot of professional athletes that went on and had great careers. Mm -hmm. But after their careers was over with, it was time for them to transition into something else. It's tough. Now, obviously, you've been able to do that very well. What would you say is one of the a couple of reasons to why you've been able to make that transition and do it very well? Well, I mean, it's, it's just tough, and I'm, I'm I'm still working on the very well part. I don't know if I'm, I think I do it good. I'm not sure that I'm doing it very well yet. I think. But we just stamped it. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was stamped on the rolling ground, not just sports and entertainment show. You heard it first, right here. Very well. <laughs> but it is a, it's a transition. Yeah. It truly is. It truly is a transition. And um, having good people, I'm very fortunate. I come out of a team concept, as you guys did. You know, it's very important to have your teammates and other people around you who are able to make your business model work, right. yeah. make your business better. I got very solid partners that I work with. You know, um, you know, some of my partners, I think you have them on, on one of your shows coming up is Westar Mortgage. They do a, they're probably my best corporate client without a doubt. I mean, they believe in community, they believe in supporting kids in youth sports, youth fitness, everything that I'm about, fighting childhood obesity, mm -hmm. all these things that matter yeah. to me personally. That also allows me to generate business for myself, my kids, as well as for their company. So, I mean, having the right people around you is the most important part. Skip, do you, can you help me understand a little bit more about Gary Clark's business model? Can you kind of dig into that a little bit? For well, me? I know a little bit about it, and, and the part that I miss, I'm sure Gary will correct me on it. He'll get it right. But as I understand it, because I, I don't also, even understand my business. I'll, 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 <laughs> so I'll tell you what, folks. We're, we're, he we're, set me up. We're going to develop. I, wait, I can't wait to hear it quite often. Huh? Gary Clark's business model here on the Rolling Ground. All right, so you're going to do is have fun. This is an exclusive. Skip, go ahead. Tell me a little bit about your perception of the Gary Clark business. Well, model. let me just say this. I also used to work in the mortgage business on the financial uh, side of it with a gentleman who taught me a lot, Malik Wade, uh, who now has his own uh, consulting company. And I had an opportunity to meet Gary Clark uh, a couple years back. And so I do know that Gary Clark has his own title company or is it doing something along well, affiliated, with, affiliated, with, affiliated with a title company. So in the in, in the ramifications of mortgages, that's what I know about Gary Clark. If I've missed something, I know you're probably doing some mentoring just, and just speaking maybe, just, and maybe a all that. Bit. You can clean that up for me, but I think just folks, I've done a good enough job of setting the platform for Gary well, to finish the, it. I hear the term business development yeah. when I talk to and about Gary Clark. Um, 
I'm not asking for the ultimate definition of it, but from your perspective, when you say that you're involved in business development, how do you describe well, I, that? I think in most industries, they, like for example, in the mortgage industry and, and with mortgage loan officers for real estate agents for title companies or if you're in the legal field for litigation, lit uh, litigators, that's what they do. I'm a mortgage guy. My job is to originate loans. Mm -hmm. I typically don't really know how to develop business though because that's not what I do. I haven't created strategies. I don't know what those strategies are. I don't look at it that way. I look at the 1003 and that's what I look at. But what I do is I come in and I look at the industry as a whole. I look at how people get their business. For example, if I'm a mortgage consultant and I'm looking at a real estate agent, well, I have to know how that real estate agent gets their business to start with. Absolutely. Most real estate get, most real estate agents get their business by word of mouth marketing. That means they have so many advocates that's advocating their business for them. And that's it. So my job is to come in and widen that advocate base because their business is word of mouth. It's yep. to be like, hey, George, use George. He's a great real estate agent. It's a part of packaging. That's just yeah. that too. Yeah. So, yeah. but if I only got twenty people that know George is a good real it's estate agent, yeah. that's the only business he's getting because a hundred percent of George's business is from word of mouth marketing. So my job is to increase that advocate base. Yeah. And because of the demographic I participate in, I have almost unlimited resources in terms of I can put somebody in a thousand homes overnight. I can put somebody in ten thousand homes virtually almost overnight if I want to. Mm -hmm. And that's power because I control the demographic. Okay, so having said that, let's go back to this this thing that you just described. Mm -hmm. So you have this real estate agent that has this base of twenty advocates. Mm -hmm. Okay, these people are folks that uh, family, friends, because you start they probably, they probably sold a house for them and did a good job for and them. They sold a house for them. Okay. So these people advocate for them. Now what happens is before they sell the next house for the next person, you're coming in and you're trying to help them multiply from 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 exactly. advocates even before they do business with these exactly. folks. <clears throat> Difficult to make. Tell me a little bit about how that happens. Well, basically, if you want a consumer to do business with you, the first thing I said, I try to keep it simple. You got to give them a reason to yeah. want to do business with them. Okay. You know, so, for example, if I shop at Giant, and I like buying Crest toothpaste from Giant. Good. For Safeway to take that away from me, I have to do something for that family if I'm Safeway. So if I do something for your kid, your kid's Roland Jr., but Roland Jr. wants to play with wide receiver. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna bring Ricky Sanders in. I'm gonna have Ricky Sanders train Roland Jr. until he's 17, because he's only six years old now. Mm -hmm. I'm having him train him until he's 17 years of age. And I'm not going to charge you anything for that. All I'm going to ask is that you use Safeways and you buy your Crest toothpaste from Safeway. I captured a demographic. I gave you the reason to leave Giant to go to Safeway, to leave Safeway to go to Giant. My job is to capture the demographic, give them a reason to want to utilize their products and services. Quite honestly, whoever I say is sponsoring their kid. Mm -hmm. And they do it <clears throat> because I gave them a reason to do it. Well, having said that, hey, Ricky, look here. If you want to work with my son, he is seven. <laughs> if you feed him and clothe that joker as he gets bigger, all right, trust me, you can charge me whatever you want. Feed that boy, okay, and clothe him, and you can have him for as long as you want, and you can broker him to any relationship you so desire. Hey, folks, part one with Gary Clark. I'm going to take my jacket off. We're going to come back to part two. We're going to dig in a little bit deeper. Sit tight. Stay tuned. We're ending this particular segment of the Rolling Grimes, not just sports and entertainment show, but we'll be back. We will